Lesson 7 Law and Grace Sabbath Afternoon November 6 The sons and daughters of God are led to persevere in the work of overcoming by the daily realization that they need to be taught by the Holy Spirit the good and righteous way. No sham work enters into their service. Every day they realize that they must hold fast the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. When one deviates from the right way, the Holy Spirit, working on his mind, leads him to confess his error so that others will be warned against the same mistake. Never should a man be too proud to make the acknowledgement, I have erred. The least he can do, after he has sinned, is to show his sorrow and repentance. Men who do this will be honored by God, even though they make mistakes. The Upward Look, page 248 The law of God reaches to those secret purposes which, though they may be sinful, are often passed over lightly, but which are in reality the basis and the test of character. It is the mirror into which the sinner is to look if he would have a correct knowledge of his moral character. And when he sees himself condemned by that great standard of righteousness, his next move must be to repent of his sins and seek forgiveness through Christ. Failing to do this, many try to break the mirror which reveals their defects to make void the law which points out the blemishes in their life and character. We are living in an age of great wickedness. Multitudes are enslaved by sinful customs and evil habits, and the fetters that bind them are difficult to break. Iniquity, like a flood, is deluging the earth. And yet men professing to be watchmen on the walls of Zion will teach that the law was designed for the Jews only and passed away with the glorious privileges that ushered in the gospel age. Is there not a relation between the prevailing lawlessness and crime and the fact that ministers and people hold and teach that the law is no longer of binding force? Selected Messages, Book 1, page 219 The sinner cannot depend upon his own good works as a means of justification. He must come to the point where he will renounce all his sin and embrace one degree of light after another as it shines upon his pathway. He simply grasps by faith the free and ample provision made in the blood of Christ. He believes the promises of God, which through Christ are made unto him sanctification and righteousness and redemption. Being justified by faith, he carries cheerfulness with him in his obedience in all his life. Peace with God is the result of what Christ is to him. The souls who are in subordination to God, who honor him, and our doers of his word will receive divine enlightenment. In the precious word of God, there is purity and loftiness as well as beauty that, unless assisted by God, the highest powers of man cannot attain to. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1071. Sunday, November 7 Law in Heaven Sin appeared in a perfect universe. The reason of its inception or development was never explained and never can be, even at the last great day when the judgment shall sit and the books be opened. At that day, it will be evident to all that there is not, and never was, any cause for sin. At the final condemnation of Satan and his angels, and of all men who have finally identified themselves with him as transgressors of God's law, every mouth will be stopped. When the hosts of rebellion, from the first great rebel to the last transgressor, are asked why they have broken the law of God, they will be speechless. There will be no answer to give. That I may know him. Page 15. It is the creator of men, the giver of the law, who declares that it is not his purpose to set aside its precepts. Everything in nature, from the moat in the sunbeam to the worlds on high, is under law, and upon obedience to these laws, the order and harmony of the natural world depend. 
So there are great principles of righteousness to control the life of all intelligent beings, and upon conformity to these principles the well-being of the universe depends. Before this earth was called into being, God's law existed. Angels are governed by its principles, and in order for earth to be in harmony with heaven, man also must obey the divine statutes. To man in Eden, Christ made known the precepts of the law, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job chapter 38 verse 7. The mission of Christ on earth was not to destroy the law, but by his grace to bring man back to obedience to its precepts. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 48. It is no light matter to sin against God, to set the perverse will of man in opposition to the will of his Maker. It is for the best interest of men, even in this world, to obey God's commandments. And it is surely for their eternal interest to submit to God and be at peace with him. The beasts of the field obey their Creator's law in the instinct which governs them. He speaks to the proud ocean, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Job chapter 38 verse 11 And the waters are prompt to obey his word. The planets are marshaled in perfect order, obeying the laws which God has established. Of all the creatures that God has made upon the earth, man alone is rebellious. Yet he possesses reasoning powers to understand the claims of the divine law and a conscience to feel the guilt of transgression and the peace and joy of obedience. God made him a free moral agent to obey or disobey. The reward of everlasting life, an eternal weight of glory, is promised to those who do God's will, while the threatenings of his wrath hang over all who defy his law. The Sanctified Life, page 76. Monday, November 8. Law in Deuteronomy. Are good works of no real value? The scripture answers, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In his divine arrangement, through his unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit alone, and the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity, which we perform, are the fruits of faith, and they become a blessing to us, for men are to be rewarded according to their works. It is the fragrance of the merit of Christ that makes our good works acceptable to God, and it is grace that enables us to do the works for which he rewards us. Our works in and of themselves have no merit. When we have done all that it is possible for us to do, we are to count ourselves as unprofitable servants. We deserve no thanks from God. We have only done what it was our duty to do, and our works could not have been performed in the strength of our own sinful natures. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1122. A legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by a self-justifying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. The solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposing sacrifice, proclaim that the doer of these things regards himself as righteous and as entitled to heaven. But it is all a deception. Our own works can never purchase salvation. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51, verse 17. Man must be emptied of self before he can be, in the fullest sense, a believer in Jesus. When self is renounced, then the Lord can make man a new creature. New bottles can contain the new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life. In him who looks unto the author and finisher of our faith, the character of Christ will be manifest. The Desire of Ages, page 280. 
Christ has given us no promise of help in bearing today the burdens of tomorrow. He has said, My grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. But, like the manna given in the wilderness, his grace is bestowed daily for the day's need. Like the hosts of Israel in their pilgrim life, we may find morning by morning the bread of heaven for the day's supply. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day, if you will of your own spiritual choice be free and joyous in God, if with gladsome consent of heart to his gracious call you come wearing the yoke of Christ, the yoke of obedience and service, all your murmurings will be stilled, all your difficulties will be removed, all the perplexing problems that now confront you will be solved. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 101. Tuesday, November 9. Latov Lak. Obedience to the law is essential, not only to our salvation, but to our own happiness and the happiness of all with whom we are connected. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165 says the inspired word. Yet finite man will present to the people this holy, just, and good law, this law of liberty which the Creator Himself has adapted to the wants of man, as a yoke of bondage, a yoke which no man can bear. But it is the sinner who regards the law as a grievous yoke. It is the transgressor that can see no beauty in its precepts. It is through the law that men are convicted of sin and they must feel themselves sinners exposed to the wrath of God before they will realize their need of a Savior. Satan is continually at work to lessen man's estimate of the grievous character of sin, and those who trample the law of God under their feet are doing the work of the great deceiver, for they are rejecting the only rule by which they can define sin and bring it home to the conscience of the transgressor. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 218 and 219. The law given upon Sinai was the enunciation of the principles of love, a revelation to earth of the law of heaven. It was ordained in the hand of a mediator, spoken by him through whose power the hearts of men could be brought into harmony with its principles. God had revealed the purpose of the law when he declared to Israel, Ye shall be holy men unto me. Exodus chapter 22, verse 31. But Israel had not perceived the spiritual nature of the law, and too often their professed obedience was but an observance of forms and ceremonies rather than a surrender of the heart to the sovereignty of love. As Jesus in his character and work represented to men the holy, benevolent, and paternal attributes of God and presented the worthlessness of mere ceremonial obedience, the Jewish leaders did not receive or understand his words. They thought that he dwelt too lightly upon the requirements of the law, and when he set before them the very truths that were the soul of their divinely appointed service, they looking only at the external, accused him of seeking to overthrow it. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 46 Christ's favorite theme was the paternal tenderness and abundant grace of God. He dwelt much upon the holiness of his character and his law. He presented himself to the people as the way, the truth, and the life. Let these be the themes of Christ's ministers. Present the truth as it is in Jesus. Make plain the requirements of the law and the gospel. Tell the people of Christ's life of self-denial and sacrifice, of his humiliation and death, of his resurrection and ascension, of his intercession for them in the courts of God, of his promise, I will come again and receive you unto myself. John chapter 14 verse 3 Christ's Object Lessons, page 40. Wednesday, November 10. A Slave in Egypt. 
The Lord desired to guard the interests of servants. He commanded the Israelites to be merciful and to bear in mind that they themselves had been servants. They were directed to be mindful of the rights of their servants. In no case were they to abuse them. In dealing with them, they were not to be exacting as the Egyptian taskmasters had been with them. They were to exercise tenderness and compassion in the treatment of their servants. God desired them to put themselves in the place of the servants and deal with them as they would wish others to deal with them under the same circumstances. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1106. The religion of Jesus Christ works a reformation in life and character. The true Christian seeks constantly for the grace that changes the objectionable features of the natural character. Instead of speaking sharp, dictatorial words, he speaks the words of encouragement that Christ would speak were he in his place. He shows benevolence to all, not only to the few who may flatter him and exalt his wisdom. The purity and holiness revealed in Christ's life radiates from the life of the true Christian. The Upward Look, page 75. The pardon granted by this king represents a divine forgiveness of all sin. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Christ is represented by the king who, moved with compassion, forgave the debt of his servant. Man was under the condemnation of the broken law. He could not save himself, and for this reason Christ came to this world, clothed his divinity with humanity, and gave his life, the just for the unjust. He gave himself for our sins, and to every soul he freely offers the blood-bought pardon. With the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Psalm 130, verse 7. Here is the ground upon which we should exercise compassion toward our fellow sinners. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 244 and 245. We ourselves owe everything to God's free grace. Grace in the covenant ordained our adoption. Grace in the Savior affected our redemption, our regeneration, and our exaltation to heirship with Christ. Let this grace be revealed to others. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. But if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. He is alienated from God fitted only for eternal separation from him. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 250 and 251. Thursday, November 11. Not for your righteousness. There are two errors against which the children of God particularly those who have just come to trust in His grace, especially need to guard. The first is that of looking to their own works, trusting to anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. He who is trying to become holy by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. The opposite and no less dangerous error is that belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law of God, that since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. But notice here that obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but the service of love. Steps to Christ, pages 59 and 60. Not in our learning, not in our position, 
not in our numbers or entrusted talents, not in the will of man, is to be found the secret of success. Feeling our inefficiency, we are to contemplate Christ and through him, who is the strength of all strength, the thought of all thought, the willing and obedient will gain victory after victory. And however short our service or humble our work, if in simple faith we follow Christ, we shall not be disappointed of the reward. That which even the greatest and wisest cannot earn, the weakest and most humble may receive. Heaven's golden gate opens not to the self-exalted. It is not lifted up to the proud in spirit. But the everlasting portals will open wide to the trembling touch of a little child. Blessed will be the recompense of grace to those who have wrought for God in the simplicity of faith and love. Christ's Object Lessons, page 404 We would never have learned the meaning of this word grace had we not fallen. God loves the sinless angels who do His service and are obedient to all His commands, but He does not give them grace. These heavenly beings know not of grace. They have never needed it, for they have never sinned. Grace is an attribute of God shown to undeserving human beings. We did not seek after it, but it was sent in search of us. God rejoices to bestow this grace on everyone who hungers for it, not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Our need is the qualification which gives us the assurance that we will receive this gift. But God does not use this grace to make His law of none effect or to take the place of His law. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. His law is truth. My Life Today, page 100. For further reading, Steps to Christ, The Test of Discipleship, pages 57 to 65, and That I May Know Him, Reaching the Stature of Christ, page 162.